Uh, all right, microphones in a good spot. Toho blankets over my very ugly table I'd like to replace at some point. I think I'm good to go. How you guys doing? You buy any cool figures lately? I've been uh, sitting on a couple of pre-orders over the past two months, and I figure I really need to get around to opening these things. I just didn't really have the time making all those uh, One Fest videos, the pre-order roundups, but we're finally here unboxing some figures. Now I'm gonna do two today along with uh, a couple of smaller things which I'll do at the very end of the video. I figure it's better pacing if I give you the exciting stuff first. I do need to acknowledge something really quickly though. This is not the same room I was in. Um, I did state before that I was moving to a new apartment, but this is in fact not that apartment. Just haven't found something yet. But that old place is gone. It's sold, the house is no longer available. So I have this backup place for the time being, living on my own. Uh, I set up the room slightly differently, but not really. I didn't want to get too comfortable here, but I got a new bookshelf. And uh, my detolfs are not even filled out yet. And that's because I figure I'm going to be unboxing things anyway. Why don't I put the new things in the detolfs, and then we get to see them in future videos. Also, I only have two detolfs, which is kind of embarrassing. But I didn't have space in that other room, and now detolfs are like 100 bucks. Which just feels like a ripoff, considering they used to be $65, and had thicker glass, so... I don't know. But either way, let's just, I don't know, start talking about some figures. Alright, so, first one we got here, I thought would be a little bit more popular. Now, that's not to say this didn't sell well, because it certainly did from what I could tell, but, compared to some other figures in this series, does not seem like as many people were interested in picking her up. And I feel like that's a bit of a shame. So who am I talking about? I was kind of surprised that, like, not a lot of big YouTube figure channels talked about her yet, as far as I can tell, at the very least. But we have Melia from Xenoblade Chronicles 1. The Definitive Edition, very specifically the Definitive Edition because she's in that Futures Connected uh, costume that she wears. But we'll talk about that when we start, you know, actually getting into the figure. Um, yeah, I don't know why a lot of people didn't care about this. I mean, I love Xenoblade Chronicles 1. That's my favorite game in the series to date. And uh, one of my favorite JRPGs of all time. I think it hits, like, every note it tries to with, like, such a good story that really enthralls you. It really captures you, and it makes you want to uh, keep playing more and more. I have a lot of fun with it. And, um, I don't know. I could just talk about that game for a while if I really wanted to. But we're not here for my opinion of the game, really. We're here to talk about the figure, and first impression is that the box is very different from Pyra and Mithra. It's a bit smaller, which is appreciated. I could actually fit this in my closet with relative ease, and uh, the cardboard itself is thinner. They also changed the box's design completely, leaning in a bit more towards the like Xenoblade 1 aesthetic. And there's multiple images of Melia standing in front of like a field or a forest, which does fit her pretty nicely. And the X on the top of the box is a good touch. Yeah, there's nothing really to complain about here. I think it's a nice looking box. It's pretty eye-catching. Um, last note, very light. This entire box with the figure inside is extremely light. Which is slightly concerning, but also might be to the figure's benefits in the long run, considering the pose that she's in. But we'll talk about that. Um, in just a quick second. So let's just, I don't know, get her out and uh, start talking about her. All right, we got her here. What is there to talk about? Hopefully not too loud on the camera. Uh, first up, I guess I'll talk about the base because it's in my hand. We have this grassy terrain setting. Now this is not uncommon for a figure to have, but this execution certainly is. It's obviously not real grass, of course, but it does kind of feel like it when you run your fingers on it. And, uh, interestingly enough, this actually looks great when you shine some light against it. I'll have to make sure to get some, like, good shots of this on my camera. But, um, yeah, it looks really dull if you don't have light on it, and kind of bad. But as soon as that light shines, it looks kind of wonderful. And all around the outside of the base is this nice wooden finish. It makes it look like a piece of furniture, which does kind of go against the outdoor setting. But I think the grass does a good enough job to really not make that an issue, and it just makes it end up looking like a really nice base in general. So uh, yeah, I actually like this one quite a bit. She does have a metal rod to help support her foot when we put her in, which I guess I should just do now while I'm talking about it. 
All right, that went in pretty nicely. You just got to make sure you get the right angle. Otherwise, you're going to really, like, fight against this thing. Just make sure, like, you're looking at the heel when you push her down to make sure that it's aligning with that little acrylic piece. Uh, all that's left, really, before we talk about her is her staff, or I guess the World Ender, which is pretty uh, nice looking, actually. I guess I should just focus on this before I assemble it. Um, they've made this in a really interesting looking way. I love the metallic paint used for the inside of the World Ender. It's got a nice like red bronze color to it, almost like burgundy, I guess, in a sense. And it works really well with the uh, plastic blue in different tones that are, uh, I guess, making up the pointy bits of the uh, staff itself. All around it are a bunch of really sharp crystals. Like, actually, they do kind of hurt when you poke them. And I think she came with instructions, which I don't think I need, but I'll look at them really quickly. Okay, what do we got here? Uh, when connecting parts becomes difficult, try warming the parts in warm water first. Well, I don't like that. I don't like being told that it might be difficult to assemble right out of the box, that I need to uh, warm up my pieces first. But we'll give it a shot before we do that and hopefully not run into any problems. So all we got to do is slide this pole into her left arm. And I'm just going to kind of like wail it in a little bit. Don't want to do too much force and I want to make sure I'm at like a very specific angle that's not changing too much as I uh, don't wish to break her. Um, it's a little resistant, but I did manage to get it in just fine. I don't think I'm supposed to go too deep into the uh, hand hole so that the, uh, the front part of the staff is uh, closer to her body. I think this is ultimately what we're looking for. And uh, yeah, I guess we have her fully set up and good to go. You know, it doesn't surprise me one bit how nice this figure looks, but it's really nice to be holding this in my hands. And I think she does look quite beautiful. I really just love the presence this figure has. Like, the pose is full of energy. It's dynamic and lively. She looks super happy as well, like her face is just adorable. They added some nice lip gloss to her bottom lip. And even the eye decals look amazing with those really thick eyelashes and, of course, the aqua blue irises. But even better than all of that is her hair sculpt. I love her silver hair. And those unique swirly twin tails have made the transition to figure form, like, perfectly. On the back of it, actually, the hair is tied up in little braids, which I don't think I've ever noticed when playing the DLC. And it looks great, and there's even like these little parts of her costume that are adding some extra bells and whistles, literally, to the back of her hair. There's just a lot going on in this head sculpt. I haven't even mentioned the wings on the top of her head, which is a trait of the high Entia race, so they aren't just decoration for the outfit, they're part of Melia. And they're sculpted and painted really well. There's a lot of individual feathers, each feather has its own texturing, and even the paint looks really nice against her silver hair. I like the way the wings even curve around a little bit, especially the one on the left side that's almost wrapping around the staff itself. It just makes it look a little bit more interesting as far as the sculpt goes. The final piece of this head sculpt is the hairband in the front, which has a pearlescent finish and a bunch of purple-like triangles decorating it. I'm pretty sure these are supposed to be flowers, but at this size, it's a little bit hard to tell because they're all like kind of bunched together. But regardless, the extra finish is really nice against all that other type of paint. And that's kind of what's going on in the rest of the outfit too. There's a lot of different finishes on this paint job. And I think it's the main reason why this primarily white paint job isn't as dull as it could be. Like these really puffy looking sleeves, they almost look like flowers in a sense. They have a bit more of a sheen to it. They're polished a little bit more than say like the chest piece itself right by the waist and the top. Like it doesn't look like the same type of paint and it helps differentiate each part of her costume. And it's a really interesting costume as you could probably tell. It's very wide at the waist and there are these weird like almost futuristic diamonds just making up the entire like edges of the bottom of the dress. And I don't really know how to describe them any further than that. But they are in fact painted in a, um, a very clean white. There's not much shading on them. And they do look like the most, I guess, plasticky part of the figure. But because it's just focused right here in this spot only, I have no problem with it whatsoever. But yeah, the rest of the outfit also has a lot of interesting little things about it too. Like throughout her body are just some like silver chains and other distinct looking decorative pieces that give the figure some extra pop and color. Oh, and something I just kind of personally like about this figure are the little wires that can be found on her chest and thighs. While they did just kind of paint them directly onto the thighs, 
At the chest, these wires are actually molded on instead, and a few of the silver rings even have holes in them, showing her skin underneath that like thin layer of cloth. I'm just a fan of the smaller details, what could I say? I would say overall this is a pretty modest costume. She's not revealing much skin, she's less sexy in a way compared to those other figures like Pyra and Mithra, but she does have some diamond cutouts at her waist side, and between you and me, I think her butt looks pretty good. The shorts also have a very similar finish to the sleeves I talked about earlier. It does look quite nice, and um, I never knew she had quite as nice of a butt as she does on this figure. So that's a plus. Um, but yeah, I guess all that's really left to talk about are her really long boots. They got a nice design to them. I love the fact that the zipper goes all the way to the bottom of the shoe, and they made sure to sculpt the entire thing along the way. Like, they're not my favorite color, I suppose. Like, this dark navy blue isn't something that's gonna wow me. But, just like the rest of the figure, it all looks very clean. And I think that's something I guess I should, like, I don't know, wrap up with. This figure is sculpted really, really well. Like, it's a 9 or a 10 and a 10 sculpt. But the paint job is kind of like, I don't know, not really the focus point on this figure. It's exactly as it should be, but I think it doesn't really catch as many people's attention because these colors are not always what, like, collectors want. But for a Melia fan, this is perfect. You know what I mean? Like, it just does everything it needs to to look exactly like Melia. There's also just like a ton of details on this figure and some that I have yet to go over. Like her fingernails are painted, the little ribbon on her neck just looks really cute. And it's kind of like asymmetrical in design the way she tied it up. And if you were to ask me, I think the back of the dress looks even better than the front of it. And you're never going to get to appreciate this unless you turn her around. I am realizing just now though that I forgot to talk about this figure's stability. She seems pretty sturdy. Like when I shake her around, she does wiggle a little bit being on one leg and all but it really isn't a lot to cause concern. Like, I've seen much worse on figures that are balanced like this. And uh, as I stated earlier in the video, she's really light. Like, I don't have to really concern myself when I lift this figure up. It's not so light to the point where this figure feels cheap, but it certainly is lighter than you're probably used to. I don't think she's gonna be a leaner. So yeah, overall, I think this figure is excellent. One to add to your collection if you like Xenoblade, Maybe you could skip out on it if you don't play these games. Um, I could understand why Pyra and Mithra would just look much better on a shelf compared to Melia. But um, if you're a fan of this character or this game, then I think she is a must-get. Okay, so I'm going to move Melia over to my desk for now. Because I don't really want to get her in the way. But um, yeah, let's do that second figure. Now, this one makes me a little sad, and it only is making me sad because I can already tell this figure is hitting the bargain bin. And I knew this was gonna happen, but it does kind of upset me since I bought this day one. And I'm just hoping that I like the quality of this figure enough that like the future figure costing like, I don't know, 7,000 yen less or something, when it eventually does hit that bargain bin, doesn't upset me too much. Let me go grab it really quickly. I had it on the floor here. Turn it around. We have Riz or Risu from Trials of Mana. And I think for uh, simplicity's sake, I'm just going to call her Risu because that name is easier to say. Now, this is a character from Trials of Mana or Seiken Densetsu 3. It's a game that was kind of lost in Japan for a very long time, but Square Enix decided to not only translate the original SNES version, but remake the game altogether for modern consoles. And I played that remake and I had a great time. I thought it was a solid game. Not to like the standards of Final Fantasy VII Remake, they did not put nearly as much money into this game as that, but you know, for what it is, I think it's absolutely worth playing. Now, for those of you who have watched my pre-orders in 2022 video, I talked about this figure and I mentioned that like, yes, I like this character enough. Yes, I like the game but I was kind of just ordering it because I really wanted to support Angela getting a figure. And when you know it, they are in fact doing that. So consider it a mission accomplished. I'm gonna buy that figure without a doubt. Very excited for that. But we have Risu here, and I really should do her the respect she deserves because honestly, a lot of photos of this figure make it look spectacular. So even though she's dropping in price, I am still excited to finally open this and see just how she stacks up. Now looking at the box, it is a little big, I gotta admit, but I do like the way they designed it. There's a lot of like silver trim and all these like decorative shapes all around it. It looks pretty fancy, it looks pretty high quality, and it even has that little rabbit character who's in like every game in the series. 
Uh, on the back, you just get an image of her, looking very pretty, of course. But that's about it. So, I guess without further ado, let's open her up. Alright. Pop this sucker open. Oh boy. So, it's a very similar figure, in fact. It has a giant weapon, a girl standing on one leg, and wings on her head. But let's talk about the base first. Now this base is very simplistic. It's just a green see-through plastic. There's no frills to it really, except for the fact that it has like the trim that was just on the box itself. But it does look good. I really like this shade of green. And you know, just like slapping the name on it and the little rabbit, it works. I think it does work. Having the copyright all over the top of it does kind of take away from like the beauty of this, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. I like the color enough where I have no problem with this base whatsoever. But certainly, it's not that interesting. Um, it's also a fingerprint magnet, so I'm gonna try and not touch this too much further. Uh, as for Risu herself, she looks really good, actually. Um, one of the main reasons I ordered this figure was because I love the green paint they used to make this figure pop. And like, immediately, I'm just hit with such a pretty color palette on this figure. Uh, what I really like about it, I'm talking about this figure way too soon, but I love this freaking hair sculpt, man. It looks so nice, but you know what? Give me a second here. I'm gonna put her on the base. It does have a metal peg just like Melia, so it should be pretty simple to do. They put the peg in the front of the shoe, which I don't really like, but it went in very smoothly, and uh, it's balancing. It seems good. A little bit more wobbly which is a concern of this figure more so than Melia, because she's a little bit bigger, and she's definitely heavier. But we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later as we get towards the end. Let me move these out of the way really quickly. Um, I just realized there's a, like, acrylic pole in her hand. What is that for? Oh, you know what? I think it's because they want to make sure the hand doesn't shrink, so that, like, the, uh, the spear that she has can go in easier. That's pretty smart thinking. Good Smile Company should have done that, I think. Uh, but yeah, let's take that spear out. So she typically fights with spears or other pole arms in the game. Um, she is not, by the way, like a bird person. She's just an Amazon warrior, and this is just part of their costume. So while they do kind of share like a similar look, at least up here, she's not like a bird. <laughs> um, but yeah, this spear looks really nice, actually. It's uh, a little bit more simple, I guess, compared to the World Ender, but the fact that they painted the pole itself in a really nice dark red that has a bit of like a gradient like towards the middle of it, and then it goes back to being dark red, like it just changes color on each edge. It looks really nice, actually. And uh, the spear itself just looks like some really nice metallic silver paint. Nothing wrong with it. No flaw whatsoever. It's a pretty cool looking weapon. So, how you put this together? Seems very simple. Uh, in a kind of strange way, though, you slide the pole through her hair, which seems like, I don't know, a risk if she was actually fighting something. Considering that her hair is tied up, she would absolutely just swing the pole and, like, drag her neck along with it if she wasn't very careful. So, I don't know what that's about, <laughs> but it, uh, it slid in like butter. That pole that she was holding on to was really some smart thinking. Um, but yeah, she's all set up. I'm gonna move the blister out of the way now so that I can have her on camera a little bit easier and cleaner. You know what? First impression is that I kind of like this figure more than Melia, and that's weird for me to say because I absolutely was looking forward to Melia more. But I'm just so, like, immediately impressed by this paint job, and her hair sculpt looks so good. I think I need to focus on that first because I keep looking at it. It's such a long and flowing, voluminous hair sculpt. There's a couple of different shades of yellow throughout it, which makes it look that much more vibrant. But my favorite part about this hair sculpt has got to be where the hair is tied up by that really big and rather cute bow tie. Now, not only is the sculpting of this bow tie great, and it's painted in like three different shades of green, so the shading is like sublime. But if you also look at the hair at this point, you can see a bit of a dark pink gradient, which is a carryover from the artwork. Now, I do wish Flair committed to this idea a little bit more considering how prominent it was on the artwork, but it's still really appreciated and it looks great when you view this figure from the back. 
So frankly, I think it's a top tier hair sculpt. I absolutely love it. Now let's move on to the helmet, and I guess like the armor itself. And we can focus on the wings first. They're done in like a semi-transparent plastic, and there's a little bit of detail in each feather, though nowhere near as much as Melia had. Now the helmet and the shoulder pads, these are like the primary pieces of armor. They have a little bit of like gold decoration, some gold trim throughout them, and it makes up the design of the armor pieces. It looks good, they're painted really cleanly, there isn't any gold paint bleeding onto the rest of the figure, and the finishes of the armor pieces are actually shiny compared to the rest of the uh, dress itself, which has a matte finish. I mean, from afar, you're probably not even going to notice this, but it's really appreciated that they differentiated each part of her costume. But before we talk about the rest of her outfit, let's focus on her face really quickly. Now, she has these crystal blue eyes, and they look absolutely beautiful. And as you definitely have noticed by now, she also has a giant rupee, like basically from Zelda, on her forehead. But if there was something about this figure that might not be for everybody, it's definitely her expression. There's not a lot of emotion on her face. Though I do think it's very accurate to the artwork and the character itself. So I do like it and I find it rather pretty, but I understand if you don't. Now I think this next point is pretty obvious, but I gotta talk about it anyway. Her design is pretty fan servicey. She's got really nice looking thighs, a great butt sculpt in terms of shape, in terms of size, it's top notch stuff. And even her chest is a bit more endowed than I remember it being from the artwork or the game. Uh, kind of a common thing for figure companies to do in general, they like upping the bust size of anime figures. Though in this specific case with Risu, it could just be because she's pushing against her chest with her left arm and kind of squeezing them a little bit. Which does add a little bit more realism to the chest sculpt and in fact just makes them look a little bit more softer. So I think it goes without saying, it's a pretty sexy body sculpt, very supple looking and just overall some good fan service. So let's move on to the dress now which was a major reason as to why I wanted this figure in the first place. Not necessarily the design of the dress, but just like the color palette of it. I just thought it was such a vivid and lush shade of green, and I wanted it in my collection. Her waist, which is made up of these like little golden clovers, and then there's silver hooks that are also making a decorative pattern on the dress itself. So there's even more to appreciate on this dress, and it just looks phenomenal. Now, the design of the dress, I'm pretty sure, is supposed to be like a plant or a flower. It certainly looks that way to me. Um, the edges of each part of the dress are fringed up a little bit, or downward. And then underneath the top layer is a second layer that almost looks like worn out leaves or petals. It's once again just like the wings done in a semi-transparent plastic. But what I never knew about before making this video, like seriously just learned about it right now, is that if you turn the figure like upside down, and you could have seen this if you looked at the fringes carefully, but on the bottom side of the green part of her dress is a red and white pinstripe pattern. And it's just kind of funny to think about because yes, this needs to be there because it's part of the character design, but like 95% of people are never gonna see this unless they lift up the figure and just look at her butt. Because otherwise you only get a tiny glimpse of it. But it goes to show you, Flair really cared about making sure they got everything about Risu's character design down pat. So I think the only thing here I still need to talk about regarding her outfit are her boots and gloves. And they're both painted in a pretty similar way. They went for a duller gold, which I think works really well with the brown paint used for both the boots and the gloves. Now the gloves, I think, have some nicer shading on them, but that's likely because there's way less gold paint and it's primarily brown. I definitely like the designs of the boots though, it's kind of similar to the golden chain that's around her waist, where there's like these little clover patterns that are on the flaps of the boots. I just think it's kind of cute, honestly, along with the size of the boots themselves. Okay, so let's bring Milia back into the picture, just so we can get like a comparison between the two. Now, as you can see, these two are in a very similar pose, right down to the same leg that they're standing on, and the other one is being lifted up in a very similar fashion. They're both also holding onto very long weapons, maybe not the same exact type of weapon, but, you know, they do kind of have the same idea going on there. Now, as you could tell by comparing, like, the thigh size, the head size, Risu is definitely bigger, but I'm not sure if she's supposed to be a 1-6 scale. I know Melia is a 1-7 scale, but I don't think Risu has a scale, which is kind of annoying, but thankfully, it's not so different in size that they wouldn't look good next to each other. She just, I don't know, looks more like an Amazon at this point because she's a bit taller. And I think because of the way they're posing, I think they will look great on a shelf next to each other. But like Milia, I think I forgot to really talk about 
how uh, Risu is a bit less stable. You can kind of see it together how she wobbles a little bit more uh, just from like the slightest wiggle of my table. It's not the most stable table, but that is a concern over time. Why did Square Enix design her like this? I don't know, but it is a bit concerning that she doesn't have like an extra support rod and that she's a decently heavy figure. I can't see how she's going to be in a couple of years from now. That's impossible. But right now, I am very happy with her. In fact, I love both of these figures. They're both very charming figures in their own way. They're very beautiful. And I think it's kind of cool that I'm adding two weapon-wielding ladies to my figure collection. So, uh, yeah, how about we wrap this up with my final little section I want to talk about. Okay, so I moved them into the DTOF. Hopefully, they're in a good spot. But let's go into our last subject for today. Have you ever heard of the Ultra Detail figure? Now, it's kind of a funny name because they're in fact like 10 to $15 and they're like 3 to 5 inches tall. But they're a pretty interesting line and something that I'm starting to get more into as I collect. So not too long ago, I talked about Shin-Chan, how I was really getting into the movies because it's kind of impossible to watch the anime, but the movies are easily available if you look. And uh, yeah, the more I watch, the more I like of this series. So I've been looking into buying some more figures from it. Now, Ultra Detail Figure and Metacom Toy, which is the company that makes this line, they actually do have quite a bit of Shin-Chan stuff. And while this isn't the main topic of why I'm talking about Ultra Detail Figure, I did pick up a few that I might as well show off as I'm, you know, going through these figures. So first up, we have Waniyama-san. Now this character might look familiar because he's in fact on the uh, Chocobee biscuits that Shin-Chan likes to eat. But I just love the fact that they made a little figurine of this dinosaur mascot. And he looks like something out of Super Mario World. Like he would fit in the Dinosaur Kingdom. I just love this little thing. And I think he looks awesome. Like again, these are just little toys that uh, you just like display anywhere you want. They're so small, you put them on any shelf. And they're probably going to look pretty nice. Now I do have a couple more. The next one is Buri Buri Zaiman. This is a very easy one to find. Even though he's a pretty like popular character, he's always in the movies and stuff. And this is essentially his like, I don't know, not imaginary friend, or maybe he is, but he's a character that Shin-Chan created. He's a bit of an asshole sometimes, but I like him nonetheless. And I think he's kind of an essential to any like Shin-Chan collection, if you really want to go down this road. So this last one, truthfully, I don't know who the character is. He's yet to appear in any movie I've seen, but he was cheap and I liked the way he looked. So I figure, why not? He's available. I'll pick him up. This is Shirimaru Dashi. Uh, basically a Godzilla ripoff in a sense. Uh, funny enough, his butt is just out. I don't know if this is supposed to be like a dude wearing a costume or something, but it's funny nonetheless. And I just like the way he looks. It has a cool like cartoony kids vibe to him that I think looks nice. Um, but this is just like the appetizer for why I want to talk about the Ultra Detail figure. Very cool, would love to get more of these, but let me clear the table and move on to our next part. Okay, so on this channel, I think I've made it pretty clear, even in this video, that I love to collect video game figures. But not every video game will get something as nice as a Melia or a Risu, and certainly, you know, I don't really expect that. But when I get the chance, I'm gonna probably pick it up. Now, a franchise that I think everybody knows and likely everybody loves is Mario Brothers. Everybody likes Mario. It is what it is. It's something that I grew up with and I have a ton of nostalgia for it. But collecting Mario things, especially in like 2022, that's just not something I often do because I don't really like the way new Mario toys and figurines look. They just have that like perfect Mario to it that, I don't know, I feel like is a little bit boring, but Ultra Detail figure, a couple years back, maybe even like, I don't know, seven years back, it's been a while, I don't remember what year these came out in. Uh, they made a bunch of Mario figures, but because they're a cool-ass company and like to do weird things, let me uh, grab a couple of them right here. So case in point, the Mario Brothers. Now these are based on the arcade game way back in like the early or mid-80s. And this is a design that you'll never freaking see again. They look weird, their colors are wrong, they have these weird like tumor things coming out of their heads. I don't know what that's about. But I love the fact that they made these. And I've had these for a very long time. That's not what this video is about. But I'm leading up to it, alright? And I have a couple more of these figures as well. 
Another one that I have, Mario in his Tanuki suit. Mario Brothers 3, one of the best games ever freaking made, and this looks adorable. It looks perfect and is very reminiscent of that art style from back in the day. Same with these. These look exactly like they do from the Mario Brothers arcade game. Another great one, Yoshi from Mario World. Now this is like the old school Yoshi before they kind of like made him too cutesy. They tried to make him cool back in the day, and this is just my favorite Yoshi design. I also have these little guys, the uh, fat baby Yoshis, specifically from uh, New Super Mario Bros. U, though they also did make an appearance in World, but they had a different role in this game, so whatever. Now these are all great, but I've always been missing one that I just could not find for a reasonable price. I just missed out on it back in the day, and as the years gone on, it just became harder and harder to find him for a decent price. But a little bit ago, maybe like three months ago, I've been sitting on this for quite a little bit now. Um, I was browsing Mercari, great website, and I saw somebody selling this for 30 bucks. Now, that's a significant discount compared to like the $100 it normally goes for on eBay. And I wouldn't call this a holy grail, but it is in fact like, you know, 10 times more expensive on the aftermarket. So I'll leave that up to you to decide. But this is just something I've been hunting for years now, and I finally freaking got it. Uh, but either way, it's sitting in my lap. Here we have the Mario Brothers 1 Mario. This fucking guy took me so goddamn long to find. Now, the cool thing about these, which I didn't talk about when I talked about the Shin-Chan ones, is that they have the collector in mind when they design this packaging. You can just cut out the tape on the back and then slide it out. So unlike an amiibo or something, you never have to ruin the box if you want to open these things. Um, and I did go out of my way to cut that tape before making this video because I just didn't want to fumble around with it. Um, but yeah, here we have the old school Mario 1 Mario. And I just love this little guy. They have the uh, reverse colors, so not what you're used to seeing anymore. Red overalls with the blue shirt and even the mushroom design is that really old mushroom from the first game that doesn't look like this anymore, but it still has a smiley face, it's still cute, and I love the fact that they included that. It's kind of funny that I'm trying to make a big deal out of this because they are in fact $10 toys, they don't look amazing or anything, their sculpting is good, their paint job is serviceable, but you really do get what you pay for. Just because these are expensive nowadays doesn't mean that they're worth the price tag that people are asking. They're $10 or $15 figures. It is what it is. But I do think they look fantastic when you pair them up with other video game figures or you put them next to like your video game collection, just like propped up on a shelf with all your Nintendo things. It looks amazing. So yeah, this is why I like the ultra detail figures. They just do these things that no other company is gonna go anywhere near. And even if you don't like the Mario Brothers, they make The Legend of Zelda. They make Wallace and Gromit figures. Like, who makes Wallace and Gromit figures? That's so fucking cool. They make Kellogg's mascots, like back in the day mascots, like the really old designs of them. Tom and Jerry, they do Snoopy. They just do all these things that you wouldn't think about. And I would say do yourselves a favor and just like go through their catalog of figures and see if you find something that you might want to add. You may be surprised. There could be something for you in there. But that's going to do it. Thank you so much for watching my unboxing. We'll be back relatively soon with another one, I'm sure. I have a lot of stuff I need to unbox. We'll figure it out. I'll likely have another video for you next week, regardless of what the topic is. So, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Take care and have yourselves a good rest of your day. Bye.